particular forms of asceticism that that um, we um, if it, we find it, if not impossible, difficult to access to, to apply in our lives. But we also married people or people out in the world have access to disciplines that monks do not. By definition, monks do not get married. They do not have that sort of um, exchange, the mirror exchange that we were talked about when we were talking about the sacrament, the mystery of marriage, that the husband holds up a mirror to wife and the wife holds up the mirror to the husband. In the monastery, it's much more a, a concept of um, the brethren as a whole and obedience to the abbot. And then there's the, the interaction with non-believers or people who believe slightly differently than we do. In the, in the monastery, there's very little of this. There isn't, it's not you know, totally absent that you know, some monks might go off the rails and believe heretical things. But as a, as a rule, the people in an Orthodox monastery are either Orthodox or very close to being baptized. They're, they've committed this life. Whereas, you know, back when I was a software engineer, most of my direct reports were atheists. Most of them. At least, at least half, and then the other, the half of the half that remained were kind of like nominal or lapsed Christians in some way or another. Some of them were other religions entirely, Hindu, Buddhist. So we have these kinds of spiritual disciplines that they do not really have access to in the monastery, unless those people come and seek them out. And that's because of the difference in what element of the body of Christ we are. I have I likened it very shortly, I think, in the, in the section about uh, monastic tantra, that they withdraw from the world and they dedicate themselves to God so that they can plumb the depths of interior prayer. Which we not say that we in the world, laity, do not do interior prayer. But... In the, in the understanding of, of, of ourselves, our collectively, the church, the body of Christ, we would put the monastics at, at the heart. They pump the blood. They pump the blood of prayer everywhere, throughout the whole world. We are the hands and the feet, the eyes. Christ is the head, of course. Right? Christ directs where we go. But we follow the, the commandments of Christ. But without the blood, nothing, nothing moves. So we both need our own interior prayer, and we desperately need the interior prayer of true monks and nuns. Uh, and then St. Maximus the Confessor says, these three main spiritual disciplines that are, again, they are accessible to everybody. Almsgiving heals the soul's incense of power. The incense of power we discussed quite briefly, I believe, is simply the power of anger. So um, Christ, in a number of places, talks about anger in the scriptures, um, and one of them is... Uh, be angry and sin not. What does that mean? Isn't, be, isn't being angry a sin? No. Being full of rage is a sin. It's a hijacking of the power of anger towards itself. You just kind of build up anger and don't release it in any productive way. And then, of course, there are sins that can, be, that can come out of rage, right? Which is, we, we talked about murder is one of those things. But anger, fundamentally, is the power of the soul given to us so that we can repent. It's a surge of energy to allow us to kind of push the plow, so to speak. We're talking about pushing the plow, putting our hand to the plow, following the commandments. Sometimes you've got to really push because what's resisting you seems really powerful. Um, and then uh, the other one is uh, Christ said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. What does that mean? This is an oft kind of glossed over verse when we think of Jesus as like the ultimate pacifist and like nice guy. Jesus was not a nice guy. Um, Jesus was kind, for sure. But there are plenty of times where he reams out the Pharisees all the, the terrible things that they do. He's not doing so in a hateful way. He's simply saying, you know, the truth. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. We're going to hear this in a couple weeks on Holy Thursday. And that woe to you part 
It's Father Steve, probably Father Steve's favorite gospel, even if he won't admit it to the heat, the way he says it. Where you mean, Pharisee, hypocrite. Um, it's long. <laughs> He's, he is like, to, to say woe to someone is a curse. It was a curse in the ancient world. He is, he's not pronouncing a curse on them by fiat. He's, he's revealing the curses that they brought on to themselves. And so, um, back, you know, I, I, all this was, Jesus was kind, but not nice. Um, the, this kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. It means that sometimes we need to, we need to actually violently apply ourselves to resisting temptation. It will feel like an actual battle. And I was, um, I was, I think I was chatting with Ellen after the last one, uh, after the last lecture, and I, the phrase that, that um, some of the, the, the fathers who are masters of interior prayer uh, used to use, um, Vose emma, lave pnevma, give blood, receive the spirit. It means put some skin in the game. Really apply yourself. Really use that power of anger. So, um, almsgiving is what moderates that. If we have problems with anger one way or another, which we all do to some extent, then giving alms is what balances that back out. Giving alms meaning works of mercy, right? Going and giving money to the poor. Um, Volunteering at a soup kitchen. There are even spiritual works of mercy. Praying for other people. Yeah. Um, and then, so alms giving is the first one. Fasting withers sensual desire. So the other kind of main bodily you know, power of the soul is the desiring power. The sensual power. The eros, erotic. And I don't mean this necessarily in a uh, sexual way. But that erotic power is one of desiring. And so when that gets hijacked, we run into things like the hookup culture. Um, but it is fasting that kind of helps us to moderate that back and put first things first. Not that we should not desire the physical companionship of our husband or wife, but that that ultimately is an icon of desire. Desiring Christ, not the other way around, not the other way around, but we desire union with God, and so things that we do in our life are servicing that, as opposed to servicing just their own sensual desire. And the last, pray, prayer purifies the intellect, the nous. We talked about this is the spiritual organ. The anya is the rational mind, and the, the nous is the spiritual organ, and it's frequently translated as intellect or mind. Prayer purifies that part. So um, the, the six kind of deadly thoughts, the passions that we talked about, gluttony, fornication, avarice, um, anger, rage, uh, despondency, and listlessness are all related to an imbalance of the, of the insensitive or desiring powers. And then vainglory and pride are directly related to an imbalance of the noetic, the intellectual, the spiritual kind of powers. So they all, they all hit one of these major things, these three major disciplines. And St. Maximus says, the Lord has given us commandments which correspond to the powers of the soul. That's the point of the commandments. The point of the commandments is, again, a, a, a therapy program for us. So the first one, prayer. And we have kind of a, a misconception a lot about what prayer is. Uh, and so I, I will refer us to um, St. Theophon the Recluse, whose relics we have in the cathedral. There are only, or there are only loose relics. And so we brought them out for veneration during, his, uh, during the vigil that we had for him on the night of January 9th, which goes into January 10th, which is his feast day. The work of prayer is the first work in Christian life. If in everyday affairs the saying live and learn is true, then so much more it applies to prayer, which never stops and has no limit. Oh, what is that? I thought prayer was really like the Our Father and then like going through our day. 
Standing at home before your icons or you're in church and venerating them is not yet prayer, but the equipment of prayer. Reading prayers is the equipment of prayer. Hearing somebody else read them in church is the equipment of prayer. It's a tool for obtaining and awakening prayer. What is prayer? It is the piercing of our hearts by pious feelings. And this is by, by this, he doesn't mean emotions particularly, although in, in physically they will manifest partially as emotions. Um, he means a spiritual state of being where you, you, you go from humility, submission to God's will, gratitude for all that he's given to you, giving glory to him for being the God of all, um, forgiveness of, of the, the wrongs that other people have, have come to you, heartfelt prostration, you know, brokenness, conformity to the will of God. Um, compunction is, is, one, is one word that kind of sums up many of these things. It's the, it's the feeling, the sensation, the state of being where you are pierced through the heart. And some of that light shines through. Some of that light shines through. I don't know how else to, ex to explain it other than that. But he um, says uh, later on in some of his other homilies that you can have, you know, what we call a prayer rule. And I'll talk about that in, in just a second. Um, a set rule of prayers that you, that you say. But that, even that is just a tool. And if you arrive at prayer, you arrive at this kind of wordless, ineffable feeling, experience of the communion with God, or compunction, humility, and all these things. It's, it's almost when, when you are compunction, the word in Greek is katanixi. This is what, this is what these vespers on Sunday nights are all about. Katanixtikosos perinos, compunctionate vespers. Their, their poetry is, is the poetry that we have, not that the other hymns of the church don't do this, but par excellence designed to pierce our heart because we're going back into Great Lent on Sunday night. We kind of get a little bit of a break on the weekends. Everything's bright. We celebrate the resurrection. And then on Sunday night, we, we, we get back to the labor and which required to, to, to pierce the heart. And um, one thing I, I remember from one professor in seminary that, that said this, um, was actually quoting a, a, a Jewish um, mystic who, uh, you know, this just goes to show that the truth is everywhere and the, the point of the truth, you know, at least in part, that is everywhere to lead us to the church. You say prayers and they kind of stack on top of your heart and the reason you do that is so that when your heart opens up, they can all sink in and, and really hit you. So prayer is not re prayers. It's not going to church. It's not any of these things. All of those are tools for it. And so, what are some practical tips, right, for for cultivating prayer in our lives? So first of all, we we have the, the liturgical services we talked about are we worship God, right? But they're also a a tool and a school for prayer. The words, the set words of set prayers, especially those that we pray in church, are the words of saints who composed them because they were in these places. They were having these experiences. Those prayers were composed, except for the Our Father, which was composed by Christ himself, so the source of all of these feelings. Um, all of these prayers were composed by people who are having these experiences. And so they, they, they encapsulate that place, and so we use those prayers. Um, we also begin to learn the language of prayer. We begin to 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 accrue to ourselves effective tools for awakening these states in us. And um, back to the theme of askesis. One thing I tell every catechumen to do is to pray in the morning and at night, even just a little bit even just a little bit. For those who are not already praying 
or have no consistent rule of prayer. I tell this to people who, who come to my office to, for, for um, advice, too. Like, they, they'll lay out their problem for me, and it doesn't matter what the problem is. I ask them how their prayer life is. And the worse the problem, the worse the prayer life, almost always. And so the way, the way forward is not to judge a person for having a bad problem, but just to say, listen, this is serious. And what I help is get up in the morning. It's only going to take you 30 seconds minimum. You can do more if you want. Do one prostration. Take a sip of holy water. Do one prostration and say one Jesus prayer. If you want to do more of, of any one of those things, you only need a sip of holy water. You need to chug the whole thing of holy water. Okay? It's like a little bit, you know, every, just like Christ is present in every drop of communion, it doesn't matter whether I give you a big, a big glob of it or a small piece. He's, he's there in the whole thing, even in a crumb. Um, the grace of God, the grace of the Holy Spirit, that angelic power is in every drop of holy water. It's not like the more holy water you drink, the holier you'll get faster. You drink the holy water for a little bit of grace. And then, you know, do at least one prostration, at least one Jesus prayer in the morning. And um, for those who don't know what a prostration is, um, it's simply a great prostrations, kneeling down and touching your head to the floor. So I'm going to demonstrate here. That's it. And, and for any of you people who are like, like me in scientific minds and timed that, it's about four to six seconds if you really drag it out, six seconds, if you're really sore in the morning or if you're going to move slowly. Um, and if you're worried about throwing out your back, okay, don't, don't throw out your back with a prostration in the morning because your discs are all like hydrated and stuff and it's, it's, it's actually more likely. Um, so you could do what's called a small prostration or simply a bow. Where, where you bow from the waist, kind of like graze the floor with your fingertips, or, or try. It's, there, there's no need to like squish yourself down if you can't get to the floor. The point is, this posture is a psychosomatic, like, booting, bootstrap regimen, or like a, a like with your computer booting up. It needs to warm up all its circuits. Because <laughs> I'm a software engineer, I'm using these metaphors. Um, and um, we find, especially in today's life, that we're like I, I've made this 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 um, this quip a number of times. Um, brains in a meat sack. We're intellectually we're we're moving more and more towards an intellectual um, an, an information economy, a knowledge based economy, and most of our work no longer with our hands. It's like all up here. So it's very easy to get stuck here and not even know. So the church wisely has physical disciplines, including the prostration, that the prostration, first of all, the great prostration especially, I mean, it hits every kind of muscle in your body. So you are kind of diverting blood flow to everywhere, and you're kind of waking up. Um, this is true even at night when you're already awake. You awake everything like you kind of bring your whole body into a prayerful space. And um, it, it also affects what some of the fathers call the circular posture of prayer. So we talk about the, the heart a lot. And the Jesus prayer, we, we briefly mentioned the standing with the mind in the heart before God. That's one of St. Theophon the Recluse's um, uh, favorite things to say: standing in the mind before, uh, standing in the heart with the mind before God, um, or unifying the heart and the mind. And physically speaking, when you have a circular posture of prayer, where you bend your neck down and you bring your torso to closer together, that's what the prostration does. You physically come closer, which is not some. It's not like a magic posture, but it, it's simply because we are. Uh, unities, psychosomatic unities, that physical closeness helps to remind us that we need that spiritual closeness, and it brings us closer together. Um, so you do 
you know, the one prostration and, and sit down and say, and say Jesus prayers. And St. Father the Recluse, again, and many other fathers say that the important thing is not techniques or postures or breathing. The important thing is to mean it with all of your heart. To mean it with all of your heart. And, that, and that's what stand, stand with the mind in the heart before God means. To really focus on the words of prayer and not just think about them like we do many things in our information economy, but experience them. And if that's confusing, then the remedy is to try it, and it will become less confusing the more you do it. <laughs> um, Elena, you had a question. Oh, okay, good. Um, and so this is like a, a, a very simple, short, adaptable prayer rule, right? This is, we, we all live hectic lives, and it's important to make time for the things that are important. Also, sometimes, many times, let me just be honest and say, like, pretty much every day, I struggle to get out of bed. <laughs> okay? Like, I have a, have a six-month-old, um, so that's what happens. Um, mornings are difficult. So, the, the, the one prostration, one Jesus prayer, does not take any more than 30 seconds. The whole shebang. Everybody has 30 seconds in the morning. Everybody. And then if you have more, or if you're a morning person, that's the beauty. It's adaptable. Or if you happen to wake up one day without an alarm, you're like, oh man, I feel great. Well, until the time your alarm was supposed to go off, do that. Take a sip of holy water and pray a little bit more. It's a way to put first things first in action. We talk about having an arrows for God and pursuing union for God. If you start off your day with that, even that simple prayer and nothing else, you have already oriented your day. That will sanctify in some sense your whole day. And then at the end of the day, you do the same thing to kind of bookend it and give thanks for, for the rest of that day that, that God gave you. Um, now, uh, practical tips about praying with family. For example, this is also very important. One of the things that I tell all of the couples that I counsel is when I ask about their prayer lives, I ask also, are you praying together? If they're engaged, um, some say no, some say yes. If they say no, I say, are praying together. And if they want a prayer, I can give them one. But, you know, what's most important, again, is being honest. A, a prayer for strength um, for if they're engaged to, uh, to, um, to prepare for marriage, to prepare to be one, um, is very good. Uh, and that helps open up for the heart of, of both of you to open up and say what's on your heart. And that enables the hearts to come closer together. And it's the same thing with the family. When you have children and, and um, you pray with them even a little bit, have a set time of prayer with family, that, that really teaches children what is important. When you always make time for it, when you have a consistent time for it, what the time is is going to depend on what the family is. If everybody's hectic in the morning, like someone's getting ready for work, four kids are ready, getting ready to go to school, maybe that's not the best time. Maybe the best time is right after, um, you know, someone comes home from work and all the kids are there from school or after he, it's sitting at the dinner table is a very good thing too, but that's kind of just like, we're not talking about spiritual disciplines per se, um, but after you get up from the dinner table to give thanks and then do your family prayers together, the, sh the small compline or selections from the small compline. If you don't want to pray for 12 minutes, pray for a minute with your family together. A, a couple of prayers and have each child say a prayer. That's totally uh, not just just acceptable, but good. Um, and in uh, speaking of meals, a way to integrate prayer in day is to give thanks before and after meals. So ask Christ, ask God to bless the food. And as as a priest, I bless like this. This we talked. I think we talked about how this is this the the. Um, 
Jesus Christos. But as a lay person, we can bless with the sign of the cross. Well, Lord Jesus Christ our God, bless the food and drink of these your servants, for you alone are holy, now and forever, at the ages of ages. Amen. Any, any, um, any timers in the room? How long did that take? Seven seconds? Four seconds? I don't know. Less than ten, for sure. It's, it's, it, the, the question is how, not how long it takes. The question is, can we remember to do it consistently? It is the consistent application that will pay the most dividends in the long run. Um, one of the fathers says, uh, a consistent drip of water hollows out the hardest stone. I can't remember who that was. I had that written down, um, uh, and I lost where I had it written down. And I've been trying to find it for 15 years. But a, a, a consistent drip of water hollows out the hardest stone. If you, if you throw like a whole bucket of water on a stone, it's not going to do anything one time. If you drip in the same place over and over and over again, you're not going to see the changes today. But then you turn around in five years and there's just, there's a hole there. You hot out the stone with a persistent application of effort. Um, anytime we start any sort of task, a simple cross or Lord bless, Again, it's not about the time. It's about the attitude and the engagement into it. And uh, this is a good time to talk about the cross, the sign of the cross. We mentioned it with St. Basil, that this is an ancient tradition. At the time that St. Basil the Great was writing, in the mid-300s, it was already an ancient, unwritten tradition. He was writing about it, saying, who among us knows, has, has ever read, or some, who among us has ever read about or in what writing have we read about the sign of the cross? And yet we do it all the time. Everybody does. So as Orthodox Christians, we have Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We put these first three fingers together, index, middle, and thumb, the Trinity. And then these other two are kind of tucked into the palm. God as um, fully, fully God and God as fully man, the two natures of Christ. And we, we go in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or... Another way to remember it, I love the Lord my God with all of my mind, with all of my heart, and with all of my strength. Right to left, not left to right. Uh, and then um, Slavic speaking or Slavic custom churches typically do not end with a seal on their heart. Greek, Greek uh, custom ones do. Either one is fine. You know, we're in a Greek church. As St. Ambalon said, when in Rome. Do as the Romans, um, but uh, you know if you start going to a Slavic church or you have Slavic descent, <laughs> there's nobody nobody's gonna. Yeah, there's no cross police. So I'm not gonna tell you you're a Greek church. Seal your seal it with your heart. Okay. So so much for for prayer. Prayer is like the foundation of everything. That's why we we pray before we start these these uh, sessions. We pray before everything we do. We have so many prayer services to come together to learn how to pray and to pray together for fellowship. Uh, prayer is very important. And one of the things that fuels prayer is spiritual reading. So listen to what St. John Chrysostom has to say about reading the scriptures. For who, to me, who of you that stand here, if he were required, could repeat one psalm or any other portion of the divine scriptures? How many of you have memorized any significant part of the divine scriptures, would he say? Should anyone be minded to ask you of songs, of devils, and impure, effeminate melodies, he will find that many know these perfectly and repeat them with much pleasure. Okay, so I don't know, you know if pop radio is from the devil, but certainly um, I know many people that can say word for word hundreds of pop songs and have not memorized a single song. Right? This is what he's saying. The an what is the answer to these charges? I am not, you will say, one of the monks, but I have a wife, a wife and children and the care of the household. <laughs> and he says, you're thinking about this all wrong. This is what has ruined everything. You are supposing that the reading of the divine scriptures appertains to those only, the monks, when you need it much more than they. They dwell in the world and each day receive wounds. These have the most need of medicines. And so one thing, if we want to add spiritual reading into our rule, what a great place 
place to put it is right after the prostrations. One thing that my spiritual father told me when I was, uh, uh, I started being very, very busy with a pregnant wife, 20 and a half credits, um, trying to buy a house, trying to finish a degree, um, serving every day as a deacon at the seminary. He said, listen, do your prostration, flip to a random page of the Holy Bible, read one verse, and then do Jesus' prayer. The beauty of the randomness is that the Spirit guides that. We believe, right? But you can also, it's also very useful to sequentially read. Because while we do read almost every verse of the New Testament in a year, we read small chunks and we get a different sense when we read, like, we can read it the first time, just like as a novel, to figure out what, it, what, is it, what does it actually say on the surface level, the scriptures. Because many of us have not read from the beginning to the end. We have not read Genesis 1 to Revelation, you know, I don't even know what the last verse is, 29, 11, I think, something like that. Nadine doesn't even know. She's, she's Slavic, so I assume she's read the Bible a million times. Um, but, um, right, so we, we don't read sequentially, and so we don't know. There, there are some uh, well-meaning but ignorant people who accuse the church of not being Bible-based. If they had actually internalized the scriptures, they would know that almost every single line is, a, is if not uh, a direct quote and allusion to something in the scriptures. I have this PDF. I need to upload it to the drive. By the way, I, 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 uplo I updated the drive with all the references from lecture four. Um, uh, I have a PDF of the Divine Liturgy that shows every single reference of the Old and New Testament that, that the Divine Liturgy has in its texts, it's something like 95% of everything. It's like, it's not original. It's not original in that sense. It's original in the sense that the people who wrote it, St. Basil, St. John Chrysostom, St. Gregory the Great, who's sanctified liturgy we celebrate on, on uh, Wednesdays. Um, we could celebrate it every day during Lent, but we celebrate it on Wednesdays here. Um, they, <laughs> they had such great command of the scriptures that these things flowed out of them all the time. When they were praying, they were quoting scripture because they had most of it memorized. Not only as bishops did, were they required to have the entire book of the Psalms memorized, they lived and breathed this stuff. Elsewhere, he says that it is an inexhaustible treasury, St. John Chrysostom. So, even a little bit of the scriptures is useful. Sequential reading, if you can find time for it, is also useful, right? But that's a time management lecture. That's not a spirituality lecture, although the two intersect very, very closely in some instances. Um, so scripture, on reading scripture. In St. Paul's letter to Timothy, second letter to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. He's talking about the Old Testament, but of course we believe this also about the scriptures of the New Testament. And um, it's all given for inspiration by God, but then St. Peter says that St. Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has also written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them of these things, a couple of things, be diligent to be found by the Lord in peace, in which, in some of his epistles, are some things hard to understand. Anyone who has ever read St. Paul knows that some sentences that go on and on and on and on and on. And that's in English, where they break up the original Greek sentence into multiple sentences. St. Paul was a master of the Greek participle, which means he could create a sentence um, of arbitrary length. <laughs> and it would, it would be grammatically correct. But, but St. Peter was a fisherman. <laughs> and he says, you know, these are, these are hard to understand. And then the key thing here is untaught and unstable people. An untaught and unstable person is one who does not have access to the divine treasury of the tradition of the church about what these things actually mean. They open it up and they read something, most often in translation, and they think they understand what it means, and then they create a whole theology off of it. That's the systematic theology that, is, that has resulted in over 30,000 Protestants.
Protestant denominations. And I don't mean in any way to bag on Protestants, right? Because it's all in inspired. But it is even, it's not just here. Again, I'll reference the, the eunuch in Acts who is on his way to Jerusalem from uh, uh, Ethiopia. And uh, the apostle filled, caught up by the Spirit, and he finds him in his chariot, and he's reading the prophecy of Isaiah. And uh, the apostle Philip asks him, what are you reading? And he says, uh, uh, I'm reading about the suffering servant. Uh, can you explain it to me? I have no idea what's, what's happening here. <laughs> who, who, is, who is the prophet talking about, himself or somebody else? And the apostle, the apostle Philip, who has been given the grace, the illumination, by the Holy Spirit, explains it to him. And we talked about what the church is, and she is a compendium, not, not a museum, but a living organism that functions on tradition. So, um, untaught and unstable people are those who are not stable in the phronima, the mindset, the experience set of the church. These people twist the scriptures to their own destruction. They twist St. Paul's letters to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. Again, he's talking about the Old Testament. He's saying these people read, they want to read, they understand something that's different from what the Holy Spirit has given to us to understand, and then they destroy themselves by it. And um, a more succinct way of saying this is no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. St. Peter says this straight up. One of the great things about the epistles of St. Peter, they are very straightforward because, again, he was a fisherman. <laughs> um, and uh, I appreciate that. Not that I can't parse St. Paul's Greek. I didn't study Greek for, for years for no reason, but um, it's nice to be able to hear something plainly and not have to try to figure out what it means. Uh, no prophecy of Scripture is any private interpretation. So the, the main way that we understand Scripture is, as we have been saying, through the life of the church. This is why we have certain times that we read certain parts of the scripture. The gospel goes here, the epistle goes here, we read the psalm at the time, we read other things at other times, and the hymns explain them to us. And then also, the writings of the fathers is another thing that the spiritual reading that helps us to prepare for prayer and to, to, to um, guide us to not being unstable and untaught. St. Paisius, the Athenite, who was glorified uh, in uh, less than 20 years ago, I think. He passed away in 1992. I forget exactly when his glorification was, when he was recognized as a saint. He says, this just goes back to what Randy said a couple lectures ago, like, why, this is all heady, philosophical, like, um, you know, does everybody need to know, to, to, to know this stuff and to have it memorized? No, we do not need great knowledge to be devout. It's not. We don't need it. it. It is helpful for some people. For some people, like St. Peter says, if they're unstable and taught, but they have great knowledge of the scriptures, they will twist them to their own destruction. Read the fathers, even one or two lines a day. They are very strengthening vitamins for the souls. For the soul. Because the fathers are the ones who, in, in prose, we, we have the scriptures explained to us poetically and kind of in a holistic manner um, by the hymnography of the church, but sometimes even that might not penetrate us in the same way. Right? When St. Baesius says, one may be profounded, profoundly affected by a single hymn, why another may feel nothing, though he may know all the hymns by heart as he, as he has not entered into the spiritual reality. The fathers are the ones that take the scripture, and especially the things that are, that are quite difficult to understand sometimes, they explain them. St. Max says uh, the confessor has an entire two-volume set uh, of, uh, of uh, or I, I guess the, the two, two works. One of them is the ambigua, which is um, uh, explaining what St. Gregory the theologian meant, because St. Gregory the theologian also was so deep in prayer that sometimes he writes things that, that uh, it's difficult for us to understand. And um, quest are the answers to Thalassius, the questions of Thalassius, which are scriptural conundrum. There's 60, I think there's 65 different questions that St. Maximus answers that are like, you know, what does this mean? Like, uh, what do the head coverings mean? What does this verse mean? What does it mean that, that Christ wept in the Garden of Gethsemane and he, 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 
He expands it all out. And so these things are strengthening vitamins for the soul, even one or two lines a day. Um, and uh, the, the kind of last one here of spiritual reading is Lives of the Saints. And I know I started with Scripture, and then I went to Fathers and Lives of the Saints. But the easiest way to do this actually is the reverse. It's the reverse. Um, in, I couldn't find the exact quote, but I know that St. Paisius said that we should mostly focus, if we're going to be reading, we should mostly focus on reading Lives of the Saints, and then some of the Fathers, and then the Scripture. Not because the lives of the saints are somehow more important than scripture, but they are more practically applicable to us immediately. He says, by studying the lives of saints, our soul is warmed and motivated to imitate them and to proceed with manly courage in the struggle to acquire the virtues. We realize that all the saints had the same type of spiritual madness, he calls it. This is not being insane. This is zeal. This is the eros, the desire for God. They had the same type of spiritual madness, except that it appears in a different form in each of them. This is what I was talking about last week. Sin is boring. It makes us all the same. Holiness is where we find our individuality. We can see the love or eros they had for God, which in turn kindles divine zeal within us to imitate them. So a lot of lives to the saints, if you read, I mean, uh, another very practical way to do this, um, there, are, there are all sorts of apps to do this, but uh, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese Daily Readings app has readings from the scripture of the day, and also brief summaries of the lives of the saints that are, that are celebrated on that day. So the only thing it, it doesn't have is a, is a random quote from the fathers or something explaining it from the fathers, right? Someday. Maybe I'll, I'll put in a... Uh, an enhancement request, and they'll make me code it myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a dangerous, dangerous for me to do anything with computers because um, they're like, "Oh, you can do it. You have multiple degrees in it." Well, <laughs> there's a reason I left. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it's it's almost it's almost like a one-stop shop. You know, you get the daily readings app. It's free. You go. You read the, the scripture of the day. And you, you read the little bits of the lives of the saints, and, and they are like little vitamins. It's like taking your spiritual vitamins. And then, and then if you're doing that for your Jesus prayer and after your prostrations, your heart has opened up a little bit more because you took your vitamins, and now, now the Jesus prayer is more effective. You see how all that works together? Um, okay, so it is 11.10. Let's take a short break, 10 minutes. And then we're going to talk about um, almsgiving and continue.
Okay, let's begin again. I'm going to pull up my notes in. Almsgiving. So St. Basil the Great. This is this might hit hard for some people. It hits hard for me. Uh, the bread you do not use is the bread of the hungry. The garment hanging in your wardrobe is the garment of the person who is naked. The shoes you do not wear are the shoes of the one who is barefoot. The money you keep locked away is the money of the poor. The acts of charity you do not perform are the injustices you commit. And elsewhere, he says, I couldn't find the, uh, the exact uh, quote, or maybe it's a kind of a reimagining of this, an interpretation. If you have two coats, you're stealing from the poor. So I have three coats. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I, you're going, anyone seen those, um, those Athenos feta and hummus commercials with the yaya -ya that's like, uh, yeah, Lena knows what I'm talking about. One where they're, they're eating Greek yogurt together, and, um, and the yaya -ya asks them, You living together? Yeah, but you're not married. Yeah, you're going to hell. <laughs> uh, that's what I think of any time I, 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 I think of the phrase, you're going to hell. Um, this is uh, the ideal, right? And we have to remember, again, from the very beginning, first off, almsgiving, as we said, is the, is the healing of the incense of power. It's the healing of the incense of power. So coming out of ourselves and... And this is why face-to-face -face almsgiving is so important. You see the face of Christ in every, in every person that is alive. We're all icons of God. But especially, he says, we, if, you, if you kind of rewind all the way back to Judgment Sunday, before Great Lent started, he lists out the criteria for who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. Did you feed the hungry? Did you minister to the sick? Did you visit, visit those in prison? Etc. 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 Did you clothe the naked? Did you did you give water to the thirsty? You did all of those things to me. And so we're not going to be judged on, on um, even you know how well we prayed. That's important for our own spiritual powers to develop, but. We require faith in action. And so this is like one of the most practical and kind of obvious things, and it is the highest of the three virtues. Of course, if you're just, um, you have to have the right attitude, and that's why the prayer is important. The prayer kind of conforms us to the will of the church, the will of God, the will of God and the practices of the church that make this possible to make us holy. It's not almsgiving if we do it for fame. If I make an $100,000 donation somewhere and I want my name inscribed on the plaque, that's not almsgiving. That's financial support. Okay? But Christ says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's how secret we should keep our almsgiving. <clears throat> That's it for almsgiving. It's pretty simple, right? And I will just add one thing from the Ladder of Divine Ascent. So this is like the quintessential book by monks for monks. Not that it's not use, use, useful for those of us living in the world, but even in the first chapter, St. John of the Ladder, who we commemorate tomorrow, says, Some people living carelessly in the world have asked me, We have lives and are beset with social cares. How can we lead the solitary life? Meaning a life of interior prayer, of asceticism, etc. I replied to them, Do all the good you can. Do not speak evil. Have the recording, so for those who beep, beep, beep. for those who um, are watching online, I can not speak evil about my life. Not to it. Not hide it. Not be arrogant. Not hate. Not 
sure you go to church. Fast on the fourth day and the preparation Friday. Oop. Oh, it's on again? Is this? Oh, it's the, it was picking up from this one for us. Okay. Junk. Uh, preparation, by the way, Friday means the day of preparation for the Sabbath. Okay. And uh, this is why we call Friday in Greek paraskevi. Paraskevi means preparation. Um, the Jews fasted on Monday and Thursday. So they're saying, don't not fast, but fast on Wednesday and Friday. And they don't say why we fast on Wednesday and Friday. Later on, people kind of um, experienced or um, explained or attached a, 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 a uh, post facto explanation of we fast on Wednesday to commemorate the, the betrayal of Christ to the cross, and we fast on Friday because he was crucified on Friday. Um, but what is fasting? Oops. Sorry. What is fasting? So there are two types of fasting. Um, a total fast. No food or drink. And this is most, most like what they were talking about these days. Um, and if that seems kind of crazy to you, um, I refer to you to uh, the, ever, the, the popularity of the ever-increasing diet of intermittent fasting where people <laughs> yeah Catherine you intermittent fast oh yeah me too me too I haven't eaten anything today uh, my first meal is usually from from like around 12 to 2 and I have another one if if I'm not fasting the whole day um, around 6 to 7 um, so I do both the the kind of um, restriction window and sometimes alternate day fasting um, so even people who have no spiritual component or, or idea about um, what this is, do this for health reasons. They do it for health reasons. They don't eat or drink anything. Something about um, autophagy, the, the cells of the body um, renewing themselves. And um, I couldn't source this, but I know that uh, a recent uh, video I watched by a higher monk named Aidan Keller, um, Aiden is an, is an ancient Celtic name, so just because his name is Aiden doesn't mean he's not Orthodox. He's got the beard to prove it. Um, the lady used to fast three times a week, total fast, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And the monks still fast on, on Mondays in many monasteries uh, because that's the day, if we remember from Lecture 3, that's the day we would commemorate the angels, and the angels are, as we said, Mainly noetic powers, spiritual powers. They have ethereal bodies, but they don't need any food. And so the monks who are pursuing the angelic life also do not eat in honor of the bodyless powers. So there's this total fast, no food or expectation. I mean, no food or drink. And that's a fast of expectation. Um, and this is the fast of preparation for communion also. So um, in general, in general, the normative fast preparing for Holy Communion is from the night before 
Some people say midnight. Some people say after your last meal. I mean, I guess that's kind of a tautology after your last meal. Um, <laughs> you don't eat anything from that time until the time of communion on Sunday morning or whatever day that is in the morning. What does this mean for things like the pre-sanctified liturgy? Wednesday, where communion is distributed at approximately 7.15 p.m. It means that, just like in the early church, people fasted the entire day. Uh, in practice, if you're working the day, especially if you have a physically demanding job, this is easier for, for knowledge workers, um, because again, the proponents of intermittent fasting um, claim, and I, I've experienced this myself, I don't know about you, Peter, but there's certain more mental clarity after you get past the first couple times of like, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry. Once you start getting used to it, there's a, a lightness and a mental clarity that comes with not eating <clears throat> for a short time. I'm not saying like seven or eight or 25 days, but for like the better part of a day, there's a mental clarity and you, what, what, what gets released is what's called uh, catecholamines that produce adrenaline and that you actually kind of like are more, more energized. Um, and this is also a spiritual state of being. The fathers say that it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to pray on a full stomach. And if anyone has ever had a full stomach, you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> you're there, you're kind of like, Ugh, I don't want to do anything. Imagine trying to get new prostrations after you ate a 40 ounce uh, T bone. <laughs> you would vomit. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just like common sense. Um, so you're lighter in your body. And so it enables you to focus better, to not think about what you eat or didn't eat. And it's also very simple, difficult, but simple. No food, no drink, period. In practice, again, um, uh, most people try to hold at least six hours before Holy Communion uh, with no food or drink. Um, I, God forgive me, I'm addicted to caffeine. Um, so I have my last cup of coffee around 12 or 1, maybe 1.30 on the day that, that we have pre sanctified liturgy. Um, and then that's it. But um, that was, that fast of expectation was that an abstinence from all food or drink. And then um, in many ancient cultures, including this one, uh, it was also tied to the idea of one meal a day. So now um, the ascetic fast, which we talk about like, oh, this is a fast period. Lent, the Great Lent is a fast period. What that means is some sort of abstinence, right? Some sort of abstinence. Whether that means, um, well, it means abstinence from certain types of food and drink, and from total amount of food, and from um, uh, frequency of food, and from richness of food. So the easiest way to think about this, aside from the um, aside from the types of food and drink, which we'll get to in a minute, um, is that the simpler the better. One meal a day is simpler than than two meals a day. You only have to cook once. Um, and again, I'm not saying that any, anybody should go now and like, we know we're in Great Lent and have to eat only one meal a day. Not what I'm saying. Not what I'm saying. The assessment that we are able to do is more important than the one that we think we should do but can't. We do not go zero to 60, especially with fasting. We don't go zero to 60. So if, if, if I'm eating meat every single day, and like I'm, I'm just kind of like starting to learn about orthodoxy, or catechumen, or I'm like coming back into my faith. And Great Lent hits, or, or I hear Father Panagioti saying that people used to fast all food and drink on fast days for one small meal a day of bread and water. It would be foolish, foolish to go from what I was eating before to one slice of bread and a glass of water. If nothing else, you go from like maybe the, the general kind of... Um, recommended diet of 2,000 calories a day to, I don't know, 200, you will feel terrible and it's not for your body and you will not be able to sustain it. And then you'll be like, well, this fasting thing is nonsense. It's not nonsense. You just can't, you know, immediately put the pedal to the metal. You have to, it's askesis. That would be like if you started weight training and you, you went to a bench press and you put 300 pounds on the bar from the very beginning, you'd crush yourself. The problem was not with the idea of weight training. The problem was with the implementation. Right. 
So if, if anything, it's simplicity. Simplicity in amount of food, frequency of food, and also the types, the, the, um, the richness of the food. And this is why how shrimp, shellfish are technically allowed. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not really keeping the fast to eat lobster or, or scallops or stuff every single day because it costs much more than what you normally eat. And it's, it's less simple to prepare. You know, these are really rich foods. Um, and many fathers say that the, the, the money that we save with um, buying more simple foods and eat less, we give to the poor. That's how almsgiving is connected. And the time that we save by preparing more simple foods, we to prayer. So that's how this trinity of, of, um, of spiritual disciplines is, is connected. And then I saw a number of questions. I will just say, so that we can just open all the questions or defer them to the discussion, I'll just list all the foods and why, right? So why the foods? Because these are the, the foods that the fathers discovered inflame the passions more. They, they suffer more temptations from whatever they're suffering temptations from when they eat more meat. Dairy, eggs, so dairy includes milk, right, and cheese, um, olive oil, and wine, and, and in some uh, fish, olive oil, and wine. And then there's a certain hierarchy to those things. So the strictest fasts um, are all of those. And then the less strict fasts like Saturday and Sunday, you, you, you can have oil and wine. Um, a feast day like the Annunciation, during a fast period, you can have fish. And then the week of preparation before a great Lent is called cheese fair because you can have cheese. So that you only abstain from meat. Um, and the reason for that, again, is experience. This is the tradition of the church. It's not, they're not arbitrary. They may seem arbitrary because we haven't tried it. We haven't experienced that they work. But when we try it, we will experience that they work. Because there's uh, at least 1,800 years of tradition behind this. So I think Ellen had a question. Elena had a question. And Joanna, did you have a question? No? Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 Hmm. So the question is a very apt question um, that I kind of touched on but didn't answer fully. What about those who are sick? Uh, for example, for specific example, diabetics who um, have to eat at particular times, and especially if they're type 1 diabetics, have to eat a certain type of diet. Um, and uh, a ketogenic diet, which is very hard to fast on, uh, is actually the best for these types of, of people. Or if they have carbohydrates, they have to have them reg regimented and with insulin. And so this obviates, or this, this kind of makes it very difficult to both keep to the ascetic fast of abs abstinence and the preparation fast of expectation. Because you wake up, and then the first thing you have as a diabetic, or if, you're need, if you need to take a medicine in the morning with food, it needs to be in the morning with food. <laughs> so those, this is why I say it's the asceticism that we can do. For people who have come to me with those questions, um, we examine other circumstances and see, you know, can you prepare your meals more simply? Can you eat less frequently? Um, can you devote more time to prayer? Can you devote more time to almsgiving? Because again, fasting is just a tool. It's a really effective tool, really effective tool, right? But fasting is not union with God. Fasting is not even almsgiving. Almsgiving is more important. Prayer is more important. But fasting helps us to do those things. Right? Because as St. Maximus the Confessor said, it withers our sensual desire. It, it helps us to focus our desiring powers in one place as opposed to being fragmented everywhere. Oh, I want this food. I want that. You know, we don't think so much. It's simplified. It's the simple. If, if a person has a lot of dietary restrictions, someone walked in my office and said, like, this, 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 and this, and I have to have a very like, regimented diet. How do you just I fast? I said, for five minutes before you eat your lunch, pray the Jesus Prayer. For five minutes before you eat your dinner, pray the Jesus Prayer. 
there and go to a soup kitchen once a week. That's your fast. You can't change anything you eat. I'm trying to send you to the hospital. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Elena, did you have a... a no. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, what I do? <clears throat> so I think that's probably a, a question for individual counsel, um, and and I'm not a doctor, but I, I the, the question was like the the sugars the sugars from help. I'm a diabetic, but they don't last long. So what can I do? Because if you do have your insulin in the morning as a diabetic, uh, it's like you know eight o'clock or nine o'clock before you leave for church, um then you're there for two hours and the, the fruit wears off after <laughs> after an hour, right? So what do you do? Well, fat or a, a slower digesting carbohydrates may work, but I think that's a question that we should test afterward. Yeah. I, I guess. I mean, peanut butter is a staple fasting food. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then the one thing that we, that we like frequently forget about fasting um, this is something, this is one of those asceticists that's not available to monks, ladies and gentlemen. Also, disclaimer for anyone watching with their kids, fasting also applies to sex. In the same ways. So the, the normative fast is that on any fast day, husband and wife um, can, I don't want to say should, I don't like shoulding people. Um, <clears throat> that would be like the the the, the goal to abstain from one another and focus that time to prayer. Now, St. Paul specifically talks about this, and the, the rule that governs this above every other rule is you have to agree. Both of you have to agree. Because one person being like, I'm fasting, we can't, and the other person really needing to have sex, that's going to turn real bad real fast. Uh, it will not just turn into resenting the other person, but resenting the church. But again, that's like <laughs> loading 300 pounds up on the bar, breaking your collarbone, and resenting the fact that weight rooms exist because you use the tools improperly. St. Paul says, if you are going to abstain from each other for a time, agree for a time to increase your prayer and then you must come back together so that the devil doesn't tempt you. The devil doesn't tempt you. Um, but yes, it is in the same vein as food. We don't view food as evil. There's nothing unclean. There's nothing unclean about sex between a man and his wife. It's simply, as St. Paul said, to focus on something else for a time. To abstain, just like we do from certain types of food, or food in general, to focus more on prayer. For a time. My, a, a, a former spiritual father of mine, had, he, this is not breaking the seal of confession because um, this, this, uh, this lady gave him permission to say this, and he, he said it to God knows how many people, he must have said it in every class I had with him at the seminary. Um, she came to her confession, and, uh, and she was asking him all these questions about, like, you know, how and why and, 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 and when to have sex. And uh, she was in her, like, I don't know, early 40s, um, mid, mid to late 30s maybe. And she had six children. And, and he asked her, um, how often do you have sex with your husband? And she stopped for a second. She was like, hmm six times and he's like go have sex with your husband <laughs> like this is not you do not impose that burden on another person you don't get married just to live like monks that is an asceticism that's available to them they have the other asceticism okay so just to be clear it applies applies to marital relations but it is the same we have to, we have to think of it 
as the same way we think of food. It's not evil. We're abstaining for it for a time. We have to agree, and we can't, we can't agree to something that's going to crush us. It's more important, it's more important as a married couple to be unified. And if that means having sex during Great Lent on occasion, then you can work towards not doing that over a period of many years. You don't try to do that from the very beginning. <clears throat> Oh, and, and about fast and preparation for communion. This is something that is also quite f confusing to people. Um, for historical reasons, a lot of people believe that they need to fast Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or a whole week where they receive communion, including from sex, right? Um, first of all, the canons that we talked about, the canonical tradition, the canons state we don't fast on Saturdays. What does this mean? It means, that just like today, we, we don't have the strict fast on any Saturday, except for Holy Saturday. And we don't have the strict fast, like um, everything, including oil and wine, being off the menu, and um, um, one meal a day. Two meals, two meals, right? So that's the, the, the strictest way you can interpret it, right? But uh, fundamentally, this historical reason was because we lost a couple of things along the way. The ability to, uh, to really prepare for um, communion by confession. In the Ottoman Empire, um, you know, priests were kind of, they weren't illegal, but they were kind of persona non grata. And they did things like teach people how to read uh, and stuff like that. And so the Ottomans didn't like that. Uh, they didn't like people being literate because, of course, that makes it more difficult to subjugate. So um, if you're not literate, usually you can't read the manuals of confession and you can't prepare to hear confessions. You're not, you're not you know, studied, you know, and you don't have necessarily the blessing from your, your, your bishop for confessions. So... We, we ran into a situation, especially in the, the areas of the former Ottoman Empire, where um, they substituted fasting for confessions. And then there was also a typographical error about people who were married two or three times when they could receive communion according to the canons of the church. Uh, and that, it, that became um, after May fasting periods. And so it was like receive communion three times a year or two, two times a year, Christmas and, and Easter. And that somehow got attached to, you know, you have to fast 40 days before receiving communion. And then it, it typographically, like there was a typographical error that said, if this is your third marriage. That got, that got left out. And so all of a sudden, everybody was subject to a rule that they had never been subject to, which was receive only twice a year and only after an intense period of fasting. That's not the practice of the early church. And the idea of fasting on Friday, or even Saturday as preparation, um, is not a bad one, but we should be fasting on Wednesday and Friday regardless of whether we receive communion. It doesn't matter. Fast on Wednesday and Friday is what the Didache says. It doesn't say in preparation to receive communion. That's in a chapter on fasting and prayer. A chapter on the Eucharist is later. And it says nothing about fasting. Um, now, certain spiritual fathers will give this discipline that, like, if you don't, if you don't fast Wednesday and Friday and a, and a kind of a type of fast on Saturday, don't receive. Not because this is something that everybody should follow. That's, that's what that person needs for their preparation. Other people might need something different for their preparation. In the Slavic churches, we have a, a more, we talked about this la was it last week or the week before, the one-to-one -one, uh, relationship that especially the Romanian Orthodox and the, the Russian Orthodox enforce between confession and communion. If you don't, don't go confess your sins on Saturday night at the vigil, um, I say vigil because it's only two hours. I have to take some pot shots at, at Slavs, since I can't take pot shots at Protestants or Catholics. Um, and, if you don't confess your sins at the vigil, you don't receive period. 
Every single week, they're going to confession. If they're receiving every week, they're going to confession every week. Even as, as late as the mid-1800s or the late 1800s, this was not a in the Russian church. Say, the Catechism of St. Philbert of Moscow attests to this fact. He says you confess ideally at least four times a year, once a month if you're able. Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? Uh, Right. Right. So um, it's not bad to confess more often. You're examining your sins. You're repenting. You're getting grace to confess. But let's not be neurotic about it. It's not, especially if a, if a, if a, um, if the, the 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 custom is not that, then um, poor Father Steve because. I don't have the, the blessing to hear confessions. Poor Father Steve cannot hear a thousand people's confession every single Saturday. First of all, we don't have an all-night vigil. And second of all, it would take an actual all-night vigil to do it. <laughs> I would have to serve from 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. You would, would have to sit there and hear confessions from 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. God forbid if somebody had an actual, like, really difficult sin that they need some counsel on, and one of those confessions takes an hour, he's hosed. He's going to be here until 9 o'clock in the morning the next morning. So the point I'm trying to make about preparation for Holy Communion is that um, it's not related, you know, in the normal sense to anything other than that preparation, that, that, that expectation fast that we were talking about from the night before to that day. It can be related if your spiritual father tells you this is how to this is how to prepare for Holy Communion. And I mentioned in the first the very first lecture the prayers for preparation for Holy Communion. A lot of people forget that uh, or, or were never exposed to the fact that there are prayers for preparation for Holy Communion. And if if someone is not fasting and not praying in preparation for Holy Communion I would actually recommend that they, I mean, you know, try to try to, to do the total fast um, from the night before. But the first thing you want to do is pray, not fast, because fasting without prayer, the demons do that. They don't ever eat. They don't ever eat. They don't sleep. The thing that they don't do is commune with God, and they're not humble. And the union prayers really hammer that stuff home. So I uploaded those to the drive. Uh, and then, oops. Other tools for asceticism. We talked about prostrations. Um, we talked very, very briefly about obedience, kind of obliquely. A spirit father is very, I would, in some sense, it's necessary to have a, an individual mind because we're, we're all different and we're all we all have certain circumstances, and these are, these are the types of questions. Hey, I'm a diabetic, um, or like, hey, I have like, um, I have a neurological disease, something like that, that like prevents me from fasting. Or here's my situation at home, and like, what do you recommend from fasting um, for fasting uh, for marital relations? Or how do you recommend we structure our our prayer rule at home? Uh, what sh how should I pray? Uh, where should I give alms? How should I give alms? That sort of thing. Um, that's not not a conversation that we can have 12 on one because there's 12 of you and one of me or is it a 12 maybe 13 I don't know uh, and all those watching on, online um, it's fundamentally an individualized conversation and so there is the seeking of um, advice and the obedience to that advice and especially in, in confession when you're given uh, uh, a penance which again is medicine it's not a punishment if you're not obedient to it, it's like not taking your medicine. It's not like it's not like you have to be obedient because the church says it's obedience because the grace of the Holy Spirit is directing that action for you in order for you to be healed. And so if you don't take your medicine, you're not going to get better. And there's no there, it, it makes things kind of a lot easier in terms of discernment because you just do what you're told. Right? Okay, but this is not a Nuremberg defense, right? This is not a Nuremberg defense. 
if someone if 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 someone um, as a spiritual father says to do certain things that that uh, you know will blow up your marriage, um, maybe it's time to look for another spiritual father. Um, we do we are not lay people are not bound by the exact same type of obedient monks. They actually take a vow of obedience. They take a vow of obedience, but important for our spiritual health to have to be obedient to something. Um, and it's 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 not spiritually particularly beneficial to be obedient to things that you agree with, because you're not the point of it. The point of all asceticism, really, is to cut off our own self will. And so, if I'm obedient to something my spiritual father tells me. I'm just following what I want to do. It's, it's when he tells me to, something, to do something that I don't want to do that I have to put my own will aside and trust that that's from God. And the fact that I trust that it's from God, it's almost like it makes it true because I cut off my own self-will and I find grace there. Um, vigil. As we, as we mentioned, um, the Slavs have a vigil on Saturday night. Um, it, in, in its, in its, in its uh, most um, simple form, vigil is simply staying awake um, in order to pray, in order to read, in order to spend time with God. Um, now we can also stay awake in liturgical services. We do this. Um, places do it quite frequently. Um, the Saint Sophia in London actually has two all-night vigils per year. Uh, we had one earlier in uh, in January. Um, if you go to like Greece, or any other kind of like Orthodox country um, that has a full liturgical life, you can find vigils, you know, every week, every two weeks. Um, and there's a it's a powerful thing to be awake when you're not supposed to be awake but you're communing, communing with God. Um, on the other hand, I do not re- recommend simply, as a rule, restricting your sleep all the time. This is something that, that must find it a lot easier to do because of the way that their life is in community, and so they talk about this sometimes. But here, out in the world, um, not a wise idea, especially if like you're a forklift operator, to, to, restrict, your, to restrict your sleep to three hours a night. Don't do it. But recognize that sometimes staying awake for a little bit, restricting your sleep to be with God, might be something good. That is not something that you enter into. And, and in general, all of these pieces of asceticism are something that needed, we need to be guided by a spiritual father. That's, that's why the, the obedience is so important. Because that person, is like a, they, can, they can take an objective view. And they have the grace of the Holy Spirit. For, it's exactly for that purpose. Um, and then the last one, remembrance of death. This is not like being neurotically obsessed with like, oh, I'm going to die. I should wear all black and like, you know, paint my face with core paint. Um, it is simply being cognizant that day I am going to die. I'm going to have to account for my deeds. Remembering the whole, the whole shebang, not forgetting the end of the race. And it helps us to run the race with, um, with grace. It helps us to stick to the straightened path. We, 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 we need carrots and sticks as human beings. We don't just have a diet full of carrots. Um, as healthy as carrots are, it's just going to get you fat. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah, Nadine says, can it be? Considered that that uh, upon death you're no longer able to repent. Yeah, well, you you will no longer be able to do any deeds, and that's why the deeds are accounted at your death. And so you want to repent now before you're not able anymore. And just as a summation of all of this, uh, back to on the virtues and the vices by Saint John of Damascus. All of these are tools. Tools or instruments of virtue. They are not virtues in and of themselves. They are not holiness in and of themselves. None of what we were talking about. This is all how to do it, remember. This is you know, what, what do we do and how do we do it. This helps us to achieve what 
he, what, what he calls overcoming the passions. And after you do that, these practices are not as vital as humility and thanksgiving, which suffices for everything. And so the obvious question might be, well, can't I just fast forward straight to humility and thanksgiving? I'm humble. If you're saying you're humble, you're probably not, at all. Um, and uh, second, uh, maybe some people can fast forward straight to that. Um, that would be between you and your spiritual father. For the rest of us, there's training to do that because I know I'm not humble. I don't give enough gra gratitude for the things that I have in my life. And fasting, prayer, almsgiving, all this sort of self-denial helps me to realize that. Helps me to realize that and realize my, the need, the need for my pursuing the grace of God so that when he decides to give it, I'm ready for it. Okay. Now, miscellany, and I know we're almost at two hours anyway, so I, I apologize for going long anyway. <laughs> I was trying to plan to not, but there's just so much that you could say about all these topics. Um, we talked about the sign of the cross. Um, how to receive communion. We're not going to go in, in order here uh, because some of these are, are more easy than others. How to receive communion. This is a straight up mechanical thing. So we talk about how to, how to prepare to receive communion. Um, but what, what happens when you go up to receive communion? Like how do you do it? So um, in the Greek tradition, the Greek custom, what happens is or the, how to do it, is to open your mouth wide so the spoon can fit in, and then close your mouth over the spoon. I know that in, in Slavic churches, the, the priest typically dumps, he, he turns the spoon over. Now, I can do both. The problem is I don't know who's who, and we're in a Greek church. And so if I, if I start dumping the spoon, and then the person closes their mouth, there's a, there's a possibility that the, the Holy Communion goes flying. Right? And so, this is what I'm going to say, is how we should receive communion in a Greek church. Go up, the, the priest says, the servant of God, and then you say your name. Receive the body and blood of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ for the remission of sins for the eternal amen. The spoon goes in the mouth. While he's saying that, the mouth closes, the spoon comes out, and then you leave. You can do your cross too, if not. The, the thing, if you're going to do your cross, so Greeks do their cross, Russians, Slavs, sometimes kiss the chalice, um, the more important thing to know about either of those two practices is do it as long as you, there's no opportunity for you to like accidentally shift the chalice in the hands of the priest because you don't want to knock, knock it over. So like if you're really close to the chalice and you want to do your cross, step away first and then do your cross. So... If... Um, like, if it's a day where there are a lot of people in church and Father Steve is gone, uh, then yes. Yeah, like if I'm, if I'm distributing communion for like 20, 25 minutes, that means, first of all, I'm there for 20 or 25 minutes. And second of all, I prepared more holy communion. So the thing is heavier at the beginning. Um, but in general, no. I mean, we're, we're done in like 5 to 10 minutes on most Sundays. I'm thinking of um, the 15th of August last year, all the, 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 the restrictions the restrictions la um, were just lifting, and there were like 500 people in church, and 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 probably 300 of them received communion. <laughs> it was it was nuts? I was up there for half an hour, and uh, and my, my arm got a little tired. Yeah, but uh, I only really noticed afterward. You know, I didn't really notice while I was doing it. I was more trying to make sure that all these people who had not been to church for a long time were coming to receive communion didn't make the communion go flying. <laughs> um. Uh, and so that's that. That's what it is. And then so it, we we also talk about lipstick sometimes. Um, lipstick that comes off, uh, don't wear it. I mean, it's just easiest not to wear lipstick when you come to receive communion. But I know that some some women have lipsticks like non non stick or non slide or whatever. Uh, that's fine. But I remember one. I, mean, I don't even remember this person's face because I was focusing on their mouth. This was on the fifteenth of August. And there's this pink lip just came off on the spoon. And, I, and I'm just looking at it. <laughs> like, and I dip it back into the chalice. And I get, I think some, most of it comes off into the chalice. And 
and I give communion to the next person. Um, and uh, God forgive me, I was thinking about that when I was, when I was consuming the gifts. Kind of gross. But <laughs> on the other hand, it became the body and blood of Christ. So it's not gross anymore. And I didn't get sick. Um, right. So that's how to receive communion. Um, <clears throat> etiquette during services. Very simple. Stand when the people around you stand. Sit when they sit. Father Steve gives like up and downs. I, um, I'm not yet enough practiced at this. I do sometimes. Uh, so I apologize. But uh, like, like we said, when in Rome, do as the Romans. When in Milan, do as, do as the Milanese. When in St. Sophia Greek Orthodox Cathedral, do as the Greek. Greeks, right? If you have any doubt, look at Sophia Fasolakis. Whatever she's doing, do that. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I see a lot of people when blessings are conferred, like either with sensor or with the hand, doing their cross. It's not bad to do one's cross at any time, but the more proper to accept the blessing actually would be to just put the hand on the on the head, uh, hand on the heart, and bow, because. At any time we're doing the cross, we are offering essentially our own bodily prayer and, and reaching out to God. Whereas the blessing is God reaching out to us. So we just kind of, we just bow our head and, and accept the blessing. Um, <clears throat> addressing clergy. So in the Greek Orthodox Church, <coughs> excuse me, it's a sign that I need some more water. In the Greek Orthodox Church, both priests and deacons are addressed as father. Um, you could say father or deacon. This is a kind of a, a Slavic tradition, or deacon. Um, but we just we do say like pater, 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 pater. Bishops um, have different kind of ranks. And so, for example, when His Grace Joachim of Amisos, our, our native son of the cathedral, comes back on May 8th, he is addressed as Your Grace because he is not... The, um, he's not a, a metropolitan or an archbishop or a patriarch. He does not. He has what is called a titular see. Um, that's subject of orthodoxy 401, not 101. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he's a helper bishop. He does not have his own diocese. Uh, so it's addressed as your grace. Whereas someone like the archbishop, or um, if we were to go to... San Francisco that has a metropolitan, they are just as your eminence. Um, and <clears throat> the patriarch, patriarchs all have different titles. Our patriarch, Bartholomew, is his all holy, your all holiness. Patriarch Kirill, I believe, is just your holiness. Um, patriarch of Alexandria is your beatitude. So if you ever <clears throat> are going to have an audience with a patriarch, just send me an email and I'll tell you the right thing to, to call them. But the, the, the practical thing is... Um, if you're not sure, call their eminence, because that covers that covers 100% of the bishops in this country. That that is either the correct address or too high an address for them. You do not want to call like the Archbishop Your Grace. The Archbishop won't won't care. I mean, it's one time one time someone that I know uh, called him Father as a mistake, <laughs> and he was like, oh, <laughs> but but he was he didn't like. He wasn't mad or anything, but uh, it is, it's proper to show the, the respect for, for, for bishops that they um, have been, I was going to say earned, but we never earn the grace of Christ. It's simply they, they, are, they are the ecclesiological principle um, of Christ, right? And they, it is they that kind of distribute the sacraments, the mysteries, either in the form of being there themselves or in the form of empowering priests to do that in their absence. So that brings us directly to prayer with the non-Orthodox. Um, some of you who are Orthodox may have heard of this, this canon you know, that says, we don't pray with heretics. Okay. Remember the canonical tradition is uh, kind of like a fence around exactly what we know to be the church, and it's not saying that outside of this is totally graceless and like people are going to hell and all that stuff. It's not condemnatory. It's simply saying, just watch out. Beyond this point, there's some real danger. Um, and um, the principle behind this and canons like it is that just like we talked about when we, when we, we talked about the things that we believe about God, 
being very important. When someone who's not orthodox prays, there's a chance that they're praying to something that we don't believe in. And so to unify ourselves in prayer is a very intimate act. It's an intimate act, and we should enter into it lightly. Now, practically speaking, I am not telling anyone to not pray with their families who are not orthodox on Thanksgiving. Don't interpret this. Especially if, um, you know, they, they invite you to pray with them. If they're saying the Our Father, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that beyond the point of like, we, we know these prayers are in the church and this and that and the other, there is a, an inksing amount of discernment that needs to be applied in order to, to see like, is this actually something that I can pray? Or is this something that I need to... Uh, um, uh, separate myself from. And you, you don't even need, the, like, like St. John of the Ladder said, you know, try not to offend anybody. So it's very easy, simple, I suppose, even if someone is saying prayers that you, you know you don't agree with, to simply be silent and say the Jesus prayer. Not to be like, you're a heretic, I cannot pray with you. You know, that's not, that's not useful. It might be true, right? <laughs> it's not really useful to anybody. This is what uh, St. Paisius called, you know, the, the canons are like a golden, golden crowns. Uh, you know, but if you throw the gold at somebody's head, it's going to give them a concussion. They're not going to want to be part of the church if you're condemning them as heretics. So don't do that. Now, um, where, where the line is kind of drawn is uh, ecclesiological um, unity, right? So, so we find our unity in the mysteries, and that means that we do not receive mysteries elsewhere. So and an obvious thing is like you don't go down to the Catholic Church or, or across the street to the National Cathedral and receive communion as an Orthodox Christian. An extension of this principle is this, and I've received many questions about this. We cannot be official godparents in another religion. We just cannot, because that would be the same as saying you're, you're participating in their mystery, in their right. Uh, and by doing that, you are unifying yourself with something that you're not. Again, this is not the time to be like, you're a heretic. I'm not going to go to your child's baptism. You know? But simply state, you know, it's, it's an honor to be selected. I can't be an official one, but I would, I would gladly love to be an honorary godparent. Um, I, I, I have no problem with giving spiritual advice to your child growing up. You know? And for a lot of people, all they want is... A, a, a presence, a loving presence, and that we can definitely provide. And we should definitely provide, whether or not we are asked to be godparents or any other sort of sponsor. Um, now, the flip side of this is that we do not generally allow the non-Orthodox to receive our mysteries because, again, it's tied to what we believe it's the, the visible unity of the cup and from the cup from which all the mysteries proceed. So um, I cannot distribute communion under pain of canonical discipline to Roman Catholics, Anglicans, anybody who's not a confirmed Orthodox Christian. What does this mean when you travel to some place that you don't, don't know, you don't know anybody? The most proper thing to do is to request a letter of good standing from your parish that will be signed by the priest and give that in person or um, email it, ideally, to the priest that you're going to go visiting, visiting their church a couple days beforehand. Because, you know, God forbid, sometimes these things can be forged by people who, you know, just want to, I don't know, communion cruise, I don't know. Um, but um, then that, that priest can, can check up with whoever issued it near Father Steve and said, yes, this person is a steward. They're a confirmed Orthodox Christian. They are prepared to receive communion, to my knowledge, right? So that's what to do. Um, that's like the, 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 the most 
protocol um, proper thing. In practice, you could just send an email to that priest and be like, hey, I'm, I'm going to be coming. I'm from here. I, this is my, my parish priest, uh, and uh, I'm preparing to receive communion. I would like to receive communion. And even if he doesn't respond, at least you, you try. Right? At least he doesn't, he's not blindsided by someone he doesn't know coming up. This is much, a much more kind of sensitive issue in smaller churches because, of course, there are many people here who I don't know. Right? Um, I know that they're, that they're orthodox, um, but um, in a parish of 20 people where everybody communes every week, you go and you visit, that's going to be very obvious that you're like not, you're not from there. And while we should be very welcoming to visitors, that does not extend to distributing communion to someone who's not orthodox. That's not, communion is not about being welcoming. Communion is about the life of the church. That is the life of the church. That's where the life of the church flows from, and that's why you have to be a bapti baptized, chrismated, or Christian in order to receive. Um, three more, right? Kissing hands, full eye, and music. Um, the kissing of hands, this is an easy one. This has to do with um, the ideas we have or the liturgical role of the deacon, priest, and bishop. So uh, deacons do not confer blessings, and so their hands are normally not kissed. Priests confessing with their right hand, their right hand is kissed. Bishops confer blessings with both hands. I, I, I'm not, I, I'm, I, this is my audition tape for being a bishop, and I'm making it intentionally bad. Um, they, they bless with both hands, and so you, you can kiss both of their hands. Now, um, we don't only kiss by custom. We don't only kiss clergy hands. We kiss the hands of godparents uh, when we ask for their blessings at the beginning of the, you know, at the end of the baptism, at the beginning of their career as godparents, and throughout their time. Like every, when I have been able to see my godmother in person for a great Lent, I always ask for her blessing. And I kiss her hand, um, even now that I'm a priest. Um, that doesn't have to do with being clergy. That has to do with the, the blessings that that person confers, right? Just like, you know, in old times, you know, uh, men would ask the father of their intended brother for the blessing to ask for her hand in marriage. Give me your blessing or, like, give me your permission. That's it. It was a blessing before. And he would give that blessing. That's blessing, his blessing to confer. It's not a divine blessing in terms of, like, what, what the bishop or the priest confers. Um, on the flip side, the bishop or the priest, you're not kissing the bishop or the priest's hand. I've mes mentioned this before because it's not their blessing that they're conferring. I'm not conferring Panayoti's blessing when I do this. This is because this is the sign of Christ. E I C X C, I'm conferring the blessing of the Lord. That's why everybody, when, they, when people ask, bless Father, I don't say, I bless you. May the Lord bless you. Um, and then, of course, there are customs also about kissing uh, parents, grandparents' hands. Um, I, I learned of a, of a particularly beautiful custom um, that they used to do, not necessarily in my village, although they probably did it, but um, another priest, I can't remember who, every night before they would go to sleep, the, the children would line up and ask for their father's blessing first and then their mother's. And they would kiss their hands. So when someone confers a blessing on you, you kiss that hand. This is why we kiss the hands of priests and bishops, and why we only kiss the hand of the, the, the right hand of the priest and the left, right and left hand of the bishop. Because both of those hands confer blessings. All right? Um, music. And we'll, we'll finish with the evil eye because that one's the coolest one of all. Um, Nadine asked a wonderful question. What's, what's with the Teddy Dem? What's this, this stuff that, like, um, especially during the communion hymn that we chant, um, that are nonsense syllables. They seem like nonsense syllables to me. And why don't we chant actual words? This was the question of my, my, another one of my former spiritual fathers, Father John Kalanzis. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you remember him. Um, a couple of years back, um, I remembers him. Um, one time, I was filling in for forge, and... Uh, I start. I got to the part where we normally chant the Derirem, and I started chanting it, and he stops communing people. He was the only priest <laughs> that day. He stops communing people, and he goes to me, words, brother, words. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> so I 
I flipped to something real quick and I started chanting some some words. Um, and uh, and he explained to me later that like you know we we don't there are plenty of like psalms that we never hear right. Why do we then have these nonsense syllables? Because they are Jesus' prayers. That's why they these were actually it's not how are the Jesus' prayers? You you say the Jesus' prayer actually makes sense. At every time that there is possibility for one of these, what are called kratimata, these holding patterns, deridem, um, right after that is a theophany in the, the divine services. So there's a possibility for it during Orthros before the Gospel of Orthros. There is a possibility for it during the Trisayun. There are compositions of the Trisayun with, with a, a, a deridem. In there, there are compositions of the cherubic hymn with the teridem, and obviously there are compositions of the communion hymn with the teridem, and that is the kind of the most frequent one because then most most communion compositions are not forty five minutes long, uh, and so like again a day like August fifteenth, or I'm solo, I'm communing three hundred people, uh, you could just chant the same communion hymn in different melody. But the reason why we chant Deridem is because the theophany, we're, we, are, we are, up until that point, up until that point, we are praying, and um, we're praying for God to come, we're praying for him to have mercy. When the gospel is read, when the gifts come out, and then go back in, and then when they come to be communed, God is speaking to us. God is coming out to us. God is going in our mouths. There's no, there's no longer any words possible. And so the only thing is kind of like ecstatic utterances. And the ecstatic utterance of the Teridem, is the, the reason it's nonsense is because it is a musical ecstatic utterance. And yeah, there are compositions, but um, there are also some of the most form- um, types of compositions that, that people frequently improvise uh, just because that time of the service we're not supposed to be comprehending other words we're supposed to be totally locked in to the presence of God right in front of us or in our ears that's why um, so there's, there's nothing wrong with psalms God knows we say, you know, if we started Orthros at 6.30 in the morning and did the whole Orthros, 58% of it would be Psalms. <laughs> most of it would be Psalms. All of it would be scripturally related, but most of it will be Psalms. We love Psalms. But at the times when God is present, we're no longer imploring him for his mercy. He's there. He's answered our prayer. There's no more words to be had. That's why I say it's like a musical Jesus prayer, a musical ecstatic utterance, because uh, there are no words appropriate. And so the only, the only other alternate, by the way, is the silence of the pre-sanctified liturgy. That's also why we're completely silent during the great entrance of the pre-sanctified liturgy. Same concept, different execution. Um, the evil eye. The evil. Um, we talked last week about how sorcery, magic, is actually a serious sin. The evil eye is like the little baby bear of like serious sorcery. So it's real. It's real. Uh, but what's going to protect you from it is not a little blue bead on your cross. That actually might attract it to you. Um, who was it? Not St. Ambrose of Milan. Maybe St. Augustine. I have to remember. Yeah, St. Augustine in the City of God talks about how demons are attracted to particular colors, particular types of jewels, types of wood, and types of like music or, or dancing or ritual. Um, and I actually I had a kind of chilling experience that I was not expecting when my wife and I were watching some Netflix show, Indian Matchmaking. Who's seen Indian Matchmaking? 
Nope. We're all, all Pedro Zeta and I are kind of nuts. Um, it's a very interesting show, but near the end, there's one person that's having a lot of trouble finding a, a, a husband. Her man maker says, here, I'm going to give you this pendant. And it's a brilliant blue pendant. It's got a blue stone. I don't know, is it, what's a blue stone? Sapphire? What? Yeah, it's a sapphire. It was a sapphire. And she says, this will attract the energy of Shiva to you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what Samson was talking about. It might, it might not even be cursed in that sense. There might not be any rituals done over it, but just the fact of like being open to that and wearing it for that purpose might attract a shine. And the evil eye is like a little shine. The evil eye is not somebody... God forbid going to some secret ritual place and do a dark ritual. The evil eye, unfortunately, happens when um, we say in the prayer to dispel the evil eye, whether it's by like somebody kind of being jealous of beauty or success or things of that nature. Um, it happens most of the time unintentionally. But it is like a, just like everything, the demonic influence is like a scale. So we can have full-blown possession on one side, which exists, but is quite rare. And on the other side, we have a, a, something like the evil eye, which can happen. Um, and the only reason that like, the life of the church, confession, communion, and stuff like that, um, don't make us completely immune to it is because I sin. So every time I confess and I commune, you know, I make my my vessel integral again, and then five seconds later, I start poking holes in it. I start sinning again. And, and uh, it's that combination of someone who is struggling perhaps with jealousy and doesn't even know it, and has had something evil attached to them in a small way, and then they project it onto other people, and may or may not latch. But the way to get rid of it, um, there is a prayer in the book of what we call, what the Anglicans call the book of needs. We just call it the book of prayers, Ephrologion. Um, prayer specifically against it. And also, I mean, even better than that, um, drink holy water every day, confess and commune. Say, there's nothing special. You know, and and, and take, the, take the little eye off of your cross. The only thing that's necessary is your cross. Like, like we said, the eye may or may not actually attract it to you. Um, so yeah, so I know we went well over. I apologize. Um, but that is, uh, that's the extent of everything I wanted to share with you all. And um, what's that? <laughs> uh, thank, thank God. Um, and uh, I'm always open to, uh, especially criticism. Like I, 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 I enjoy, you know, hearing uh, positive feedback because uh, I'm, uh, I'm vainglorious and it helps me feel passion. But if you have um, constructive criticism about how to improve the course, um, perhaps not do two and a half hour sessions. I have already gotten that criticism once, and 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 I'm I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking of how to structure it. Maybe in the fall to do like twice a week, one hour, as opposed to one marathon session. Um, and more resources and things of that nature, or other questions that should be answered. Uh, I'm all ears or eyes if you email it to me. Um, and uh, if this has sparked something that you want to discuss privately, I'm always open to that. Send me an email. We'll set up a time, either Zoom or, or depending on how sensitive it is. I prefer in person always, but um, I, I'm open to both. So... Um, Remember that all we started all of this by asking why we are here. And we drilled into some, some nitty gritty things today, but it goes back, backward, right? So those things help us to fight the passions, which help us to be purified, which help, help us to live the life of the church so that we can receive the grace of God. And knowing him, we can be in union with him. That's the whole point of all of this. So if, if any of that has sparked a desire in you to, to recommit or to commit for the first time to the path or take another step, then glory be to God. Thank you. Uh, and now we have some time for discussion. Randy. Hmm. 
The question is a very good one. Um, Randy asks, what about all those who are not baptized, like Muslims or Jews, Hindus? Um, St. Paul actually says that the law of God was inscribed on our heart. And so they will be accountable for that at the last judgment. Um, whether they, um, I think St. Saint, Saint Justin Martyr explains that as, um, did, were they virtuous according to the highest ideals of their own society? Right? If they had never been exposed to Christ. Now, if they had been exposed to the preaching of Christ, they are accountable for that, just as we are all now. Sorry, now that I've told you all this stuff, you got to really put your hand to the plow. <laughs> and now that I've told you all this stuff, i got to redouble my efforts at getting the plow. Because otherwise, I'm going to go to hell for being negligent, for teaching all of you, and then not doing it yourself, for being a hypocrite. So, but to answer your, to, to kind of wrap the answer, uh, no, we don't believe that they are necessarily going to hell just by virtue of being outside the church. That's one of those things that I, I, I mentioned this before. We don't believe in this idea. It's kind of quoted to me often that like we know where the, where the church is, but we don't know where it's not. We know exactly where the church is. I have described all the boundaries to you in the past 13 hours. Um, but um, what we don't know is where the Holy Spirit energizes. Because it energizes everywhere in some sense. But like we said, um, for different people, it, it energizes different ways. And from, for those outside the church, it works subtly and sometimes slowly to bring them into the church. So if they die somewhere on that path outside of the church, who am I to say that they're going to hell? I don't have that. I, I don't have the power of judgment. Christ alone has the power of judgment. So I, we, we can't say that they're going to hell. We can say that their beliefs are not saving. We can say that. That is what we call judgment with righteous judgment. It's differentiating between a particular person and a system. Or a practice system. Does that make sense? Gandhi would be a perfect example. Yeah, or Mother Teresa, right? I don't know. You know, I don't know if we no idea. And then uh, even on the other side, I can't say if Hitler's going to hell. I can't say that. I can say that Nazism is probably not a saving belief system. Atheistic, manipulatistic, racist. You know. Uh, not saving belief systems, but Hitler, I don't know. Uh, ben, three quick ones. So I'll ask them in reverse order. The, ben had three questions. One, the, the patristic, patristic Nectar, which is, if you don't familiar, familiar with Patristic Nectar publications, awesome resource, very um, inexpensive for what you get. I, I bought a like 10-hour lecture series on um, marriage and family for $15. A phenomenal set of resources. Um, they have a Synaxarion, which is a... a an audio, um, like a podcast or an audio book of the short lives of the saints. Yeah, absolutely. That would be a great way to, to inject more lives of the saints into your life. You know, um, the second question, and God forgive me, I'm like I said, I'm addicted to caffeine, so I, I forgot what was already. What was it? Yeah, in the in the Pandocratura, the 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 Christ in the dome, the Christ in the dome. Um, he is making a sign with his hands. Uh, I believe so. Yes. Now, not all it, um, is that sign with his hands. The East Christos, the blessing. Um, not all gestures and icons are the same. So he's not always making that gesture. And those gestures, my understanding of them is that are actually 
actually connected to the, um, the rhetorical and oratorical tradition of ancient Greece and Rome. So they would, they would, they would have like, when they, when they have their finger up, it's like, I want to say something. When they have it like this, it's like I'm teaching. When it's like this, it's like wisdom or something like that. It, it, this was something else, you know. So they make all these different hand gestures. And if you know them, you kind of enter into iconography a little bit more. Um, I, like I said, I'm not an expert in iconography, so I have no idea. Uh, but that one for sure is, is the, the blessing. And then the first one, catechumens, did catechumens need confession? Um, ideally, yes. So um, my understanding is that uh, up until recent times, catechumens um, were first of all exercised at every time that they were they were given instruction. Because remember, they're not baptized, so they're outside and the demons are influencing inside. So we exercise first, exorcise, cast out the demons, and then they can be illumined a little bit. But that requires physical presence, um, and it also requires uh, your sponsor to be there for that. So um, for those of you who don't have godparents, that's why I haven't done that for you. Um, that officially makes you a catechumen. Um, and then sometimes shortly before the baptism or chrismation in some cases, um, there is a life confession. Yes. Now, in practice, what I understand is we don't we don't do this anymore, and um, it's highly recommended that a catechumen go for confession right at, like soon after they're baptized. But if I get, if I'm blessed to if I'm given the blessing to hear confessions, I would actually like to restore that because I think that's that's really important. Yeah. You did a life confession. Yeah, yeah. So I so. Uh, you want to say that, that in the Romanian church they still do this? Because when you came, when when did you come in? So two years ago. Oh my gosh, it was only it was only two years ago. Um, it feel like a two years. Um, yeah. So Ioana was saying that when she was was taken into the when she was received the Romanian Orthodox Church, she did do a life confession. Yeah. So um, I understand, and maybe this is just what we've done here at Saint Sophia, and. Other Greek Orthodox churches still do this. I know that before my ordination, I did a life confession. So it's like these big kind of banner events. You do you, you kind of like you not only do you confess the sins that you confess since your last confession, but you take a long look at your life. And you're like these are my patterns. These are my passions. Um, I'm, I lay it all out there because I need God to come in and just cleanse me. Yeah, Elena. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. I wouldn't say it's not necessary, but the fact that you're still asking for forgiveness about them means they're still troubling you. So that would be something that, you know, uh, God willing, when you go to confession, that you need to examine. Yeah, yeah, because maybe you need to make a reparation for it. I don't know. I, I would have no way of knowing, right? And uh, and thank God I can't hear confessions yet, because that's a whole other thing. That's that's a whole like if you think priests are accountable for a lot, you know, before they hear confessions, hearing confessions of people is a, one of the primary ways in which priests, um, you know, would get condemned <laughs> to go to hell. Is, is giving them the wrong ju- the wrong the wrong guidance and leading someone astray essentially alienating them and from ever coming back to church. That's a, a big, big sin. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you all very much, again, uh, f- for your patience, most of all, because we've been here for nearly three hours today. Um, I hope this has been useful for you. I said, please uh, let me know if you want to discuss anything else individually. Uh, other than that, God bless you, and uh, see you tomorrow, God willing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to the Lutheran Church tomorrow. <laughs> You're always welcome here. Um, with Father Steve, yeah. yeah.